everybody. Welcome again to Bold Strokes Books first bookathon. If you were here with us for the last two sessions, thank you. Um, this session is a girl's best friend, all about animals. I have mine right here. We will be listening. Um, two quick things about Zoom. At the top right hand of your screen, there will be a little icon that has a whole bunch of boxes in it. That is the gallery view. That will give you the best um, view of our panelists. And at the bottom of your screen, there's an icon that says Q&A. Please post your questions to our panelists in there. You're welcome to use the chat roll um, for any commentary or comments or compliments um, to our panelists. But for questions, um, post them in the Q&A. So now I'm going to hand over to the lovely Nell Stark as the moderator. Why, thank you. Um, it's so wonderful to be here with everyone. I hope you are safe and healthy and hanging in there during this time. Thanks for joining us today. So I have got this wonderful panel that we're going to talk about animals in fiction the entire time. Some of us have our animals uh, with us. And if we are interrupted by animals during this panel, it makes perfect sense and is very appropriate. Um, so what's going to happen is that I'm going to introduce each panelist in turn and then allow them to speak briefly about their work and how uh, animals feature in their work. So I'm going to start with our newest author, Nancy Wheelton. Nancy is a veterinarian and writes from her home in Ontario, Canada. Veterinary Partner is the first book in her lesbian romance series about veterinarians living and loving in Western Canada. Look for book two, Veterinary Technician, in 2021. And you can find out more at her website, which is nancywheelton.com. Um, Nancy, would you like to describe how animals feature in your fiction? Well, um, <clears throat> uh, the, the, that's better, hear myself. The series uh, centers around um, <clears throat> A veterinary clinic uh, based in Saskatchewan, which is in uh, Western Canada. Um, I based the veterinary clinic and the town on a place that I used to live in practice. Um, so the, the animals feature in that their um, um, pets are the main characters, as well as um, patients um, and, uh, and livestock as well because it's a it's a rural farming community so um yeah there's there's animals in probably not every scene but uh um they're they're in there a lot that's great and and are you the kind of veterinarian who practices both uh the large animals and the small animals or do you specialize in one um i've been a veterinarian for over 20 years so um i've done it all um, small animal, mixed animal, a livestock medicine, uh, research, teaching, um, and yeah, just just every every aspect. Um, the the first two books mostly center on um, a mixed animal practice, so um, sort of more more interesting and I think more relatable to readers will understand that kind of business because you're in the door with your own pets. Uh, you know, um, hopefully not too often, but uh, but you understand right. that. Great. Well, thank you so much. We'll look forward to hearing more from you. Um, so next, we have Angie Williams. Um, and I'm going in reverse uh, seniority, by the way. So Angie just had a book come out in April, OK? So just this month. So congratulations, Angie. Angie Thanks. grew up in the dusty desert of West Texas. She now lives in Northern California with her wife, who is Megan O'Brien, um, their son, and a menagerie of dogs, cats, snakes, and tarantulas, which is pretty exciting. Her debut novel, Mending Fences, as I said, was released this month. So Andy, uh, Andy, that's a new name for you. Angie, tell us a little bit about how animals feature in your fiction. It's funny you say Andy, because uh, I have just a slight Texas accent still, and like, at least 60% of the time when I talk to people on the phone, they say, they think I say Andy instead of Angie. Um, well, there you go. <laughs> anyways. Um, yes, I have, um, this is Riley. He needs to go on a diet. <laughs> and, uh, she is kind of, <laughs> she's a, um, cattle dog, um, Toy Poodle Muppet mix, and she uh, is kind of the catalyst in my uh, novel for the characters getting together. Um, she's also in um, Her Best Friend's Sister by Megan O'Brien. <laughs> um, 
so she's quite popular in the lesbian fiction. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm so sorry, I can't, what was your question? <laughs> it's fine, you're doing play. great. You, you, you answered it, you're good. I just we love Riley. A panel, and then I'm coming to this one, so my brain is like. <laughs> no, you're, so you're good. And, and you have just proven that girls help girls get girls. Uh, girls help, dogs help <laughs> girls get girls. Is that, that's, that was confusing. But what I meant was dogs help girls get girls, right? Oh yeah. Take the dog for a walk, you can definitely attract another girl. Um, all right, oh, yeah. now we're on to G. Jackson Lee, who also has a friend on with her. Um, a three-time Goldie winner and Lambda Literary Award finalist, D. Jackson Lee writes passionate romances with a touch of Southern humor. Animals, particularly horses, feature prominently into all 13 titles that she has published by Bold Strokes Books. Jackson is a career journalist, looking forward as she nears retirement to the day when she can devote all her time writing happily ever after stories rather than editing what's wrong with the world articles. She lives in North Carolina with her three very busy terrier mix rescues. So what do you have for us today? Um, well, I like to, my trademark really is that I usually have horses in my books. Um, I don't currently still own any horses, but um, I like to use animals in my books for, uh, they make uh, sometimes, um, this, the, they're great settings, uh, uh, equine settings, or help drive the plot. Um, animals are great for uh, to help the characters express emotions that they're not ready to express to the other main character in a romance yet. Um, so sometimes they can you can reveal things um, about the character uh, as they relate to pets. Um, you can uh, sometimes the way they relate to their pets gives you a clue about their character. Um, the um, some of my characters like in Touch Me Gently. Um, one of my characters who has a special gift that she sees as an impediment or sort of a disability. Um, she adopts a German Shepherd that was. Um, bred for breeding and you know and but he has a flaw he's deaf and so he shouldn't be in a breeding program and so um he's a great dog but he has this one thing that makes him an outcast for what he was uh, his purpose um and so um she identifies with him and she adopts him and and um sort of, um, you know, their animals reflect their character. So I think it helps, um, it helps the reader unconsciously um, understand, identify with the character, because we sometimes identify with our pets. Um, sometimes they're, they're what we wish we could be, like more extroverted, um, more loving, like you can, uh, you may be too shy, I to approach that woman that you want to, but you're not, you know, you're not afraid of re being rejected by your dog. So you can always pick them up and hug them. Mm -hmm. You know, even if you're too shy to go hug the, the woman you really want to. Um, and I think a lot of people identify with that. And so they identify with animals in, um, in books. And uh, so I think that, I think that furry friends in books uh, are a great vehicle and uh, readers identify with them a lot. Absolutely, thank you, thank you. So last but certainly not least, we have the woman who needs no introduction, but we're gonna do it anyway. Radcliffe has written over 60 contemporary romantic intrigue and paranormal romances. She is a three-time Land of Literary Award winner, the recipient of the Dr. James Duggan's Outstanding Mid-Career Novelist Award, and was named last year a trailblazer of romance by the Romance Writers of America. She founded Bold Strokes Books, an independent LGBTQ publishing company, and is the current president and publisher. So Rad, could you describe for us, you know, how you have integrated animals into your fiction? You've done that in a lot of ways. Um, I agree with Deb, first off. I think that giving a character a pet helps to humanize them. It allows you to see them in their quiet moments it's, it allows you to show the character when no one else is on stage because they're interacting with their animal. 
So it's another way of developing character that readers, I think, really relate to because most of us love, oh, that, that's my pet. That's Rue. Um, he is the facsimile of one of my uh, 12 roosters. And uh, a one-legged rooster features strongly in the River series. And um, he's a pretty popular character. But at any rate, I think that there's a very funny saying about alpha heroes. If you want, and alpha heroes are sometimes not very well liked, but if you want to humanize your alpha hero, give him a cat. Um, so I think it's a tool to help develop character. In my books, I like, when I really write an animal that's not just part of the family, which I often do forget to feed on page. I don't, I can't do that at home. But I like to make them a central character. I, and I realized as I was looking at my books, I've written two war dogs. Um, one in Love to the Rescue, which is a search, this is part of the River series, and that's where the one-legged rooster shows up as well. Um, so in this one, there's a returning vet with her war dog, and they have both obviously had a very difficult time uh, during the war. And he, the, the dog, Hancho, it's a female um, search and rescue dog. And the main character is, was a paramedic. So they went through the same experiences together. So they're bonded over that. And that was, a, that was really an important part of this whole book was that dog. And of course, the other character is a vet. So I've written two books with vets, this one in Desire by Star Starlight, two with war dogs, this one in Price of Honor, which... Um, was a Secret Service canine dog. And for me, they're really important ways to connect the character to the reader the way that we've all experienced the love of an animal and allows them to reveal sides of themselves that they can't. Here. And you've also written werewolves um, and other oh, kinds yeah, of werewolves. So how, how does that factor in? <laughs> Well, for that, when I decided to write paranormal romances after having written 25 contemporary romances, I knew I was going to go in a totally different direction. And for me, I really wanted to write the primary impetus, besides the fact that I love paranormal, is that I wanted to write um, relationships and societies that were free from the kind of censor censorship that we're used to, including sexual censorship. And I thought that writing paranormal characters would allow me to do that. And it has. I've been able to create a different way of interacting with different sexual interactions that are perfectly natural for this society that we couldn't, can't always experience or express in our own as easily. Not that we don't, but not as easily. Great, well, thank you all. Um, so audience, please chime in with your questions in the chat. You're welcome to type in your questions and we'll do our best to get to those later on. Um, my next question for you all is one that some of you have already started to answer and you're welcome to elaborate on your answers. Um, but the question is, what are the pros and cons of including specifically pets in story plots. So for example, as Rad mentioned, if you've got a dog in the story plot, you need to make sure that the dog gets fed and walked sometimes, theoretically. Or for example, after a night of wild passion, if the characters wake up in the morning and they don't take the dog out, uh-oh, right? The reader is left wondering, is the poor dog being taken care of? So what are some pros? What are some cons? Um, elaborate on that for us. Anybody who'd like to go, go first. I am totally guilty of not walking the dog. Um, I have a dog in the Provincetown Tales and I have to constantly remind myself or ask someone else to remind me to walk the dog because I get so involved with what's happening with the characters that I forget. So I try actually not to do that anymore. I try to only include animals if they're critical to the main character and the storyline because you know, animal abuse is not good. Yeah, and some readers really do pick up on it, which which makes oh, sense, right? Oh, What's absolutely. happening to the poor dog? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Nancy, how about you? Um, <clears throat> in um in my in my first book, Veterinary Partner, um, uh, the animals were um, one of the main animals was uh, dairy. It was um, beef cattle on a farm. So uh, the veterinarian was going to the farm to help the farmer, and she was, of course, um, having a lot of difficulty. 
And so this um, kind of threw them together a lot, um, really set up the conflict. Um, so that was that was really a pro. It was easy to go in and 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 you know people are crabby and they're tired and and they're not you know being a bit snarky and it's like you gotta look after your animals. Well, I don't know what I'm doing. You know um, the the that's a pro because it helps to set up the conflict. Um, I think I didn't really see any cons to adding animals except when I when I over added. Um, you know, I had these little funny stories. I thought they were cute little anecdotes, um, but um, um, a lot of them got slashed in the editing process, kind of because they didn't ad advance the story. So that's a con. You can, I for me personally, I tended to kind of over add because um, you know I thought this was interesting. But um, so that can be a that can be a con if you got if you got too many stories or too many too many animals. And that's the value of a good editor, right? You put it in your first Absolutely. draft, you loved it, Absolutely. but then sometimes you've got to take it out. Um, Jackie, right. how about you? What are some pros and cons, would you say? Yep, could you hear me? Sorry, no, who'd you ask? You're asking me? I asked you, my friend. I asked you. Oh, what are some okay. pros and cons of including pets um, in your fiction? One thing you have to be careful of is uh, to not let, uh, not make the pet, the animal too cute. Don't let them steal the show. Um, the because they can, you know. Um, in uh, my last title that was out, um, Ordinary is Perfect. Uh, the dog. Uh, it was really hard not to let that dog Elvis uh, steal the show because he was based on a real dog. Um, and um and elvis did could have easily stole the show and that so i had to trim out uh like nancy said it had to trim out some of the scenes that i wanted to write in there but um because i didn't i wanted to be careful not to take the focus off of the two main characters and it was e it would have been easy to make the story all about elvis <laughs> that's a great title actually all about elvis but probably not a lesbian romance um, Angie, how about you? What are some of the pros and cons you've run well, into? Well, you know, the original title on that book. It's okay. You go ahead. Go ahead, Dan. Oh, lost her. I think we lost her. Okay, uh, that's all right. What? You go ahead. Uh, yeah. So oh, oh, in um, the ordinary is perfect was going to be playing brown dog. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Uh, Andy, go ahead. What do you think? In Mending Fences, um, not only is the dog kind of the catalyst for these two characters getting together because, uh, you know, rancher uh, Bobby Del Rey finds um, this pup trapped in a fence um, and then takes the pup to the vet and the vet happens to be uh, her high school love who she hasn't seen in 20 years. Um, but also, um, it, it gave, it was a good opportunity to, in the beginning and kind of the courtship to bring them together because she had to, Bobby had to keep bringing, um, Riley into the vet to, and so these are opportunities to mm. kind of get them together. Like they have to get together. And then, uh, and then when, once there's, tension and um and uh they're not necessarily you know they're going through a rough spot uh there were times where they had to be together she still had to take riley to the vet because she's recovering from this energy i mean injury so it kind of forced them to be together and to kind of work some things out um but it also uh gives the i um i think maybe uh Deb said this, but it gives the character a good way to kind of work out, you know, this internal dialogue is um, she's talking, she's actually talking to the dog and the dog isn't talking back, of course, or the animal isn't talking back. Um, so it's really just, you know, she's kind of working through her, her issues um, through the dog who isn't going to disagree with her. 
Yeah, it's it's sort of like it's sort of like a soliloquy, right? Instead of talking to no one, you're talking to your pet, and you're able to express those inner feelings that otherwise might not come out. And that's a that's a great device. Um, and they so we think you're pets. awesome. Yeah, of course, they always think you're <laughs> awesome, which is which is the best part, right? Um, so we've seen pets used to bring people together. We've seen pets used to keep bringing them together, even when they wish they could be apart. So to to continue that tension going, um, we've seen pets as you know points of conflict. Um, you know, and you're welcome to elaborate on any of those at any point. Um, what are some recommendations that you would offer writers who would like to do what you've done, who would like to incorporate animals in some way, whether as pets or otherwise, into their stories? Um, anybody who wants to take that, go ahead. I would like to come down on the con side of the original question. Sure. I think, in general, giving the animals a point of view is not a great idea. Um, it is one of those cutesy devices that can work, but in general, as Angie was just saying, the pets don't talk back. Um, sometimes we talk back for them, which I think works because we probably all do that. But I think in general, um, making the, the pets a real character in the story is not something that's gonna be totally embraced by a readership. And I think it sometimes gives what we're trying to create a, as a real world an unreal fantasy feeling. So, I mean, I know Rita Mae Brown did it with Sneaky Pie Brown, but I never liked those books very much. So, anyway, Deb's laughing. <laughs> no, and I think, uh, no, I totally she, understand that. I, <laughs> I, I have to agree with that. I, I, I don't accept, although I did it with my dragon horses. Uh, that That's was different. Fantasy. That's very normal, and they're different. They're sentient beings. Right. No, I, I, I totally agree. I think animals can empathize with the character. I think sometimes they can be sort of a secondary character, but not, uh, they can't talk. The, you know, they're reflections. Well, I think animals and kids soften a character. Like mm -hmm. the way a character treats an animal or a child or an elderly person um, really softens that character and you tend to like them, <laughs> you know, just because they're good to these uh, kind of vulnerable, you know, people or, or uh, animals. Yeah, I think sometimes, especially when characters, when you're creating a loner, for example, in terms of using pets, in developing character and story if you're developing if, if you have a character that doesn't make connections well in the outside world or is a loner or for whatever reason is isolated to have them come home to an animal i think is a good way to show another aspect of their character and show that in fact there is a way in there's there's a chance that you know a connection can be made so i, I mean i think that that's fairly common and I think that's a, a good device. And they're not a serial killer. <laughs> yeah, usually they're not. Very true. <laughs> I don't think I've ever, you know, read about or seen a serial killer that was good to animals, right? That's one of the big red flags. Yep, they don't have pets. Yeah. That, that's well, they, they don't have any start. human uh, contact and then they don't have any animal contact. Mm, very true. <laughs> so we have, we have some questions from our wonderful audience. So I'm going to turn to some of those for a few minutes. Um, this one's from Anne. For those who have a cat in their stories, we've been talking a lot about dogs, but for those who have a cat in their stories, how do you get the cat out of the room when things between the characters want to get frisky? Right? It's easy to get a dog out of the room, but how do you get a cat out of the room um, when they don't want to be caught? Some, you, you close the door, um, and, and sometimes they, they, they stay out, and then it can be kind of fun if they sneak back in at the wrong time, um, but um, that's... That's the main thing with cats. Nice. Any other thoughts on how to get a, a, an unwilling cat out of a room? Oh. Catnip, there you go. <laughs> Bring out the catnip. You got to have your emergency stash of catnip so that you can get frisky. Um, here's yeah, another one that's... for Rad specifically. Oh, no. Go ahead, Deb. I, that's the only way I could think of to get a cat out of the room because you can never shut a door on a cat because they'll stick their little arm under the door and rattle it you know you know what i'm saying who doesn't know that oh, yeah. oh, if yeah. you've ever had a cat and that's why i'm a dog person sing the uh, song of their people while you're trying to 
you know, romantic. <laughs> that is not a that is not a romantic way. You know, that is not a good soundtrack, right? Mm -mm. Um, so this one's for Rad specifically. Um, how did your experiences and passions for dogs, wolves, etc., influence your writing of the wolf wares? Did that idea come from somewhere paranormal, werewolves versus vampires, or was it a real animal-related idea? Um, and this particular reader loves your series. Oh, well, thank you. Um, yes to all of that. Um, I, I really like paranormal and have always liked science fiction and paranormal, so that was what prompted me to want to write some. In terms of, and I have included in that series, werewolves, vampires, um, and in the latest installment, Enchanted Hunt, which will be out in September, I've expanded a little bit and we've got some um, bad sorcerers coming in and some other things that are happening in the paranormal world. But I'm very interested, I like wildlife and I particularly like wolves, and I'm very interested in the social, social culture of wolves. So I really tried to create the wolf wares to mimic wolf society in terms of the dominance patterns, how they socially relate, beta wolves, omega wolves, and translate that into a, a true culture. I mean, the, the one thing that matters most to me about writing the paranormals that I have written is that none of my characters are ill, infected, abnormal. They're all basically um, evolutionary divergent evolutionary lines. So if you can think of humans going down one side, then the wares and the vampires are simply branches of that tree. And it's the otherness that I wanted to explore. And I, I picked the wolves because culturally and socially, they really, they interest me a lot. Great, thank you. Um, so here's another question from one of our audience members to everyone. Um, and some of you have already touched on this, but what are your favorite animals to write about and read about? Anything you haven't said already about that? Um, one of my characters has a ranch. And so I, I enjoyed, I grew up, you know, in West Texas and around horses and chickens and you know all kinds of animals and um i enjoyed um writing that and kind of revisiting because now i i'm not around i'm around you know smaller animals but i'm not around uh, large animals anymore so it was fun to kind of put myself in bobby's world um when writing that and uh and kind of relive you know revisit some of those feelings because it's uh you know just kind of those wide open spaces and horses and you know that's just it, it's a very uh kind of there's a lot of not romantic stuff about it you know like uh having to clean up uh, stalls and stuff but there is a lot of uh freedom that you feel when you're around um you know a ranch and horses and and that kind of thing so that was that was fun that's great and another and, spin on um, that question oh sorry go ahead nancy no nope. no i was gonna say um <clears throat> i liked incorporating um a dog in in um in my books and in veterinary technician um one of the main characters has a dog that's um you know been you know it's the best been my best friend dog for for 14 years and it's elderly it's one of those you know, black labs kind of graying around the muzzle that just kind of sits there and stares at her while she kind of, you know, works out her angst and her, and her problems. Um, but, um, you know, when her, when her, um, she forgets to fix a latch on a gate and her dog gets out mm -hmm. and, um, and, and gets poisoned, um, you know, there's, there's a real tense moment when she takes it uh, to the vet. And uh, of course she gets help, but, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, um, it, it gives you sort of that hero opportunity too. Um, but the, the veterinary technician who helps is kind of, you know, you get into her head, she's going back and forth between trying to do her job and worrying about, you know, what happens if this woman's dog dies, she's never going to want to talk to me again. Um, so that's, that's, mm -hmm. uh, that's huge. That's where the, the, the dog comes in. Um, and, and it's, it's also, you know, can be a, um, a fun character because they have their own personality, but but um, but they never they never take over except when 
this one does actually try to crawl into bed at the wrong time because he's used to being there. So <laughs> that's great. That's great. What about what about a slight spin on that question? Are there any animals that you haven't yet written about that you would like to, or that you plan to? I want to write one with a pig. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> Why? I don't know. Um, pigs are neat. Pigs are really smart, and um, you know because they're not beautiful, they're so underestimated. Um, I um, I had an experience one time when I was, uh, um, it was I was blogging at the state fair one year, and um, uh, one of the one of my blog items was this um, woman that was a teacher. She had a pig that painted pictures. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was actually a teacher, but she had this pet pig and he had snout cancer and mm -hmm. to pay for his treatment, she would come, she would go around to these fairs and um, do these little demonstrations with him and, you know, people would, and then she would sell his paintings that he did and it paid for his veterinary treatments. And <laughs> this pig, he was the real deal. I mean, he really was, he would do little tricks and stuff, but. Um, when she put that empty canvas in front of him and gave him little cans that had different paints in them, he went to town. Boy, he loved to paint. <laughs> and it was amazing, amazing to watch. In fact, I have, um, she, I got her to sell me his painting that he did while I was watching him to do the blog item and um, I have it framed in my foyer and I like to ask people what they see when they look at it and um, they all think um, because I have a lot of horse stuff in my house they'll always invariably they'll say oh I see a horse in there they think it's some modern art or something. And to a person, they always say, I see a horse, except for one person that saw two horses. <laughs> and when I took it to have it framed, the woman in the framing shop said, um, is this a local artist? I really like this. <laughs> I said, no, he's from Virginia. <laughs> That's an amazing story. Anyway, I, I always have horses, almost always have horses in my books. So, you know, it's no, uh, you don't have to guess about which one I like to write about. And a book I have coming out in August is Blades of Bluegrass, and it's written uh, in uh, Kentucky horse country. And I had an amazing time researching for that. And um, um, so my preference is horses, but I'm still thinking I might write a book about a pig at some point. So this is great because one of our audience members actually asked a question that you have answered without even knowing the question, which is, have you ever seen an animal related event and thought I must put this in a book? And <laughs> clearly you have. So that was brilliant. Does anybody else either have, uh, have an answer to that question um, or want to, you know, want to circle back at all to, to another question? Any, any animal related event that you're like, I've got to do this in a book. Well, I, I have done it. I go to the uh, county fair every year, every fair that I can go to. I now live on a farm and I live about 40 minutes from where I grew up. So, and, and there's a fair locally that my parents took me to from the time I was like three. So it's like one of my fondest memories. So, so now I go to all the fairs in July and August and this year, maybe not. But every time I go to the fair, and I walk through the animal barns, I think, and I talk to all the farmers about their animals so I can figure out like, you know, what do you do with the, with the boy cows? Um, that kind of thing. And they all look at me, I know you're laughing. Um, I knew you would. But I get inspired when, when I go to the fair. And that's, I think my love of the, the birds in particular, I really, I have upwards of probably 90 hens and roosters now. And I have a new flock of 24 chicks just now. They're two weeks old. It comes from just going to the fair and seeing the animals, and now I can have them. So that, that's, that's where I get my animal inspiration. And my, all my animal knowledge, I just ask the farmers. <laughs> Great. 
other answers to that question? Either, you know, have you ever seen an animal related event and you had to put it in a book or where do you get your animal related inspiration? Well, um, I had lots of animal related events um, <laughs> yeah. from, from practice um, and, and, you know, some of them were in the book and, and ended up not in the book. Um, so, but, but I still, I still have them and maybe there'll be a place for them another time, um, to help it advance a, a character, but there's always did, another book. Yeah. <laughs> I, I had a, I had a story about a pig that was from practice and, uh, you know, it was really cute, but, um, but, uh, you know, if, if it, uh, there, there wasn't a place for it in veterinary partners so maybe in one of the other ones, but, um, I also worked with, you know, pocket pets too they can be quite quite fun um you know hamsters and and gerbils and and that sort of thing so um you know i could i could see something i could see something in there maybe someone who's a little bit kooky who has like a house full of them um not that there's anything wrong with that folks <laughs> but um you know there could be there could be an opportunity for some interaction um and and just and and some fun to, I mean, if I can't, if I can't sort of laugh sometimes at, at people in the book or they can't laugh at themselves, then, then I think it just gets a little too serious. So um, the pets are good for, good for adding humor. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so Nancy, we actually have a follow-up question for you. As a vet, oh, okay. what are some of your pet peeves? Okay, so pun intended, right? But what are some <laughs> of your pet peeves if any, when it comes to how animals or vets or vet techs are usually portrayed in romances, when you're thinking about, you know, you're reading a romance, not one that you wrote, a vet or a vet tech or animals are portrayed, but it's done in a way that sort of gets your goat a little bit. Again, pun totally intended. Um, what, what, what are those pet peeves? I, you know, I can't think of any off the top of my head. Um, I, I, of the way they've been portrayed. I guess sort of if there was a little bit of a pet peeve, it was that I think they've been perhaps under portrayed um, and, and there's an opportunity. Um, I, you know, I, 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 love, I love lots of books, a uh, um, big romance um, novel reader, um, you know, doctors, cops, um, the whole thing. Um, but I just, you know, I think there's, I think there's room to kind of expand it a little bit and, and bring those pets in. So no, the, the veterinarians and the vet techs and, and, and the farmers I've seen have been done uh, very well and felt very, very authentic uh, to me. Yep. Great. Great. And thank you, Christina, for that question. I forgot to call your name out. Um, so this next question is from Lainey Lynch. Lainey, we, we love you and Lee sending love to Oregon. Um, do all of you have a favorite book with an animal? And if so, what was the title of that book? And also, did it inspire you to write animals in your books? Wow. If you can think of just one, you can also name a couple if necessary. <clears throat> I'm really seriously not trying to just plug my wife's book right now. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> But in uh, Battle Scars, she has um, two of our actual dogs. They're therapy dogs. Uh, oh, one of them is a therapy dog, and the other one's a dog of the vet. Um, but those are our actual dogs. Um, Jack, who is still with us, who's how old is Jack? 14, 14 at this point. Uh, he's a shepherd mix. And um, our Great Dane, Jagger, who passed away two years ago. Uh, and we're still completely heartbroken about, um, about losing him. And so it's, it's, you know, having him in that book, the Jagger in the novel is much better behaved than the reality. <laughs> I don't know, you know, people who have had Great Danes, they are a handful, but they have so much love, but, um, but it's neat to be able to go back to that book and revisit their relationship, the you know relationship between Jack and Dagger, and um, and uh, it's like he'll he'll kind of live on forever through that. So, and it's a good book, so everybody should buy it. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, other answers to that question: books featuring animals that you love that have inspired you. Well, um, 
I guess historically, there's all those books we read when we were kids. I was particularly stuck on the Black Stallion series. Um, <laughs> yeah, everybody's nodding, you know the ones. Um, but, uh, you know, in, in more of the romance field, I've, I've um, there's a couple books with a, one I'm, one I'm listening to now, an audible with a dog called Elvis. <laughs> and, uh, and, there's, <laughs> and there's another book, uh, um, another series of books where uh, one of the main characters had a dog called Elvis. And I just crack up every time Elvis came in the room because he didn't have to do anything. He just sat and stared at somebody until they started talking to him. So, uh, you know, I, I, think, I, think, I think that's fun. That's great. Any other answers to that question? No. Okay, we can we can totally move on. Um, Jane Fletcher has a very specific question for you, Rad. She is wondering about the species of rooster that you have behind you. She she says, <laughs> is that a black-breasted red old English game bird, bantam or standard size? So she's get, really getting into it. It's a standard know? size. It's it's a he. Well, obviously, he's not stuffed. It's ceramic, but it's a he, it's a he, and it's standard, and he's probably a Rhode Island red rooster. There you go. Um, there you go. They're very cold hardy, which is what we need up, up here in New York State. Yeah, it's going to snow tomorrow. Um, so this is going to circle back to, a, to an answer that Angie gave recently, um, which is the downside, and, and, you know, the downside of having pets is that you lose them. Um, how do you make or approach the decision to have a character lose their pet in a story? I wouldn't. You wouldn't? I wouldn't. I, I have. Can't. I wouldn't. I mean, I think it's probably a, a great challenge and it, it'll introduce, you know, obviously an incredibly cathartic moment, but I personally can't read them, so I wouldn't write, I wouldn't write them. Deb, it sounded like you had an answer too. Uh, yeah, I have done that before. Um, it's a very sensitive thing, but it's very real life. Um, uh, it was an old pony. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a life cycle kind of thing. And, um, uh, I use it as a tool to bring the two main characters together, and uh, it it was um, it was sad. So it was so sad that I I never do read it in any readings. I can't. Um, but uh, it was um, I tried to treat it with as much care as I could. So um, and, and with as much um, respect. I mean, in the same way as uh, in ordinary is perfect. It starts off with, uh, um, you know, I've written books that have funerals in them, people funerals, and people seem to, the readers seem to take that a lot lighter. <laughs> than, oh, absolutely. You, know, you, you can kill a person kill anytime, <laughs> you know, and of course, and then my Dragon Horse War series trilogy, um, you know, characters die in every one of the books and, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I, I had to kill somebody off, at least somebody in every book. And and if a warrior got killed, uh, of course, a dragon horse would die too. And uh, so um, it, you have to do it very carefully and very nobly. It has to be a noble death, I think. And, um, but I, I, I do it very sparingly and I can only think, you know, outside of the fantasy, I only think of once that I've done it. Yeah. So let's circle back to a, a happier question. This is a good one. Um, <laughs> what method do you use as a writer to match a character with an animal? And so the example for uh, one example is, you know, someone who's been in law enforcement might have a, a German Shepherd or something like that, or a retired Shepherd, something like that. What, what, how do you match your characters with an animal? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, if, if we're thinking about animals as a reflection of character or an extension of character, or even contrasting character, it's a fabulous question. But I mean, I sort of, 
I always think about my character's occupation because that's such a big, or profession, which is such a big part of the, how I create character. So the animals kind of generally in my books go along with that as opposed to being the animal that stays at home. They're all, it's often a working relationship, but it's, it's a great question. I'm sure the other guys know how to answer it. I, uh, one of my secondary characters in Mending Fences is the mom of, um, of one of the main characters. And she is extremely hard on um, Grace uh, her, her entire life. Like, you know, as Grace was growing up, she's always very um, strict with her and not very loving towards her. Um, and very kind of prim and proper and everything had to be neat and tidy and in order. And anytime Grace kind of fell out of that, um, she would, you know, get very upset. Well, she has birds and, uh, you know, the thing with birds is they're extremely messy. Like I grew up with a parrot and, and a c controlling person could not, you know, have uh, I, I would think that it would just drive them bananas because there's just seed everywhere, like no matter what you do. Um, and so uh, I kind of use that to sh show where um, Grace saw these birds as, you know, her mother is able to kind of keep these birds in these cages and, uh, but she still loved them and she still accepted them even though they're, you know, making a mess. Um, but she couldn't extend that to grace, like mm -hmm. that um, uh, forgiveness uh, to grace. That's great characterization for sure. Anybody else have an answer about how you match your characters to animals? I think that um, uh, th that's a hard question. Um, and maybe I have to think more about it, but um, it, it seems to me that just about any personality would would be um, can, can end up with a with a pet um, that that they didn't intend to, and, mm. and I think that's what I incorporate in my books. My my veterinarian and, and veterinary partner, and she's we see her again a veterinary technician. She just keeps wanting to bring everything home, um, everything that needs looking after, and and. And she's fortunate in that her partner's like, bring them all. I got an empty barn. We'll fill it up. So um, I don't think they so much match individual pets. It's just they're kind of the ones who who take all the strays and, and the wounded and the injured ones, and, and they'll take them all home. So, um, you know, that's, that's, that's how they match. That's fantastic. So um, I know we're almost out of time. Um, so we're going to have one last question from, from the audience here. This is from Anne, um, and it's, it's uh, talking about birds, but these are wild birds, not, not parrots that are domesticated. Has anybody ever written a story featuring wild animals or birds, or would you consider writing a story, perhaps birds of prey that are injured, um, you know, rescue kind of thing? Go ahead, Rad. Wild shores. It's a first responders, um, mm -hmm. and it's, it's basically what happens uh, in a wildlife bird refuge. So there's that, that's it. Excellent. Anybody else, would anyone consider that? I, uh, I have something that I haven't submitted yet. Um, I'm still kind of working it out, but um, it's about an ornithologist who works in um, Monterey Bay, California, for the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And um, she's always been, when she was a kid, her father is, um, a scientist and when she was a kid she and her father would go on these trips to look for this bird that um, is thought to be extinct it hasn't been seen since the 80s um, but every year they would go to different places where you know people would report a sighting and look for it and so now her father's kind of older and she hears that there um, which there hasn't been any sightings in years she hears there's a sighting in, in Alaska um, and so she uh, convinces the Monterey Bay Aquarium to let her uh, go up there and spend two weeks looking for this bird that's thought to be extinct and uh, she is uh, she meets up with a, 
a ranger who um, takes her, you know, into the park and uh, they end up spending, you know, a, a couple weeks. And it's very, at first they really don't like each other, um, but they end up liking each other. <laughs> of course they do. Of course they do. It's a romance. So a we've lot. run out of time. Yeah, I'm sure they like each other really a lot. Um, so you're, you're going to see one of my little assistants here. She's, uh, she's waiting for me to give her a treat. That's Zelda. Um, and she's also telling me it's time, time to stop. Um, so thank you all so much. There is a flash sale on now, 15% off ebooks featuring animals. Uh, no pre-orders, ebooks only. The coupon code is FRIENDS. That's case sensitive, all caps. That's going to be posted for you in the chat. So please make sure that you check those out, use that code, get some new books. Thank you so much for all your questions. Thank you, Rad, Nancy, Angie, and, and Deb for a great panel today. Everyone, please stay safe and uh, take care. Thanks again. Thanks everybody for coming. Thank Thanks, you. Now. Thanks. Thanks, Nell. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Nell. Great job. Thanks. Thanks, everybody.